Good morning, everybody. <laughs> let's, let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, please, please give us wisdom to understand this closing part of your speech to Job and to us about why you ordain suffering and the significance of behemoth and Leviathan, that we need eyes to see and ears to hear what you're teaching this word, and apart from your grace, I can't teach it, and no one here can understand it. So we ask for your grace liberally uh, for this matter, and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so the last time we touched on this issue was way back in chapter 3, and what's this issue? Behemoth and Leviathan. This is what we've been waiting for in God's response. And it caused a great deal of controversy. And before I set apart teaching my view, which could be controversial to some more today than in the past, I just want to say I'm not worthy to teach this subject. Nobody's worthy to teach this subject because we are men. And men are not worthy to teach the things of God. But I believe that God works through unworthy people, which is his church. The church, which is all of us, are guided by his Holy Spirit. And by his grace, unworthy people could participate in his truths, understand his truths, teach his truths. So, though we are fallible, I think we have to show some deference to the church at large. If Christians for let's say 1800 years taught something and was generally understood a certain way, it doesn't mean that is the right way to understand it. Our conscience is held captive to the scripture, which is God's revelation, not to people's interpretation of the scripture. However, there has to be some deference. We have to have the humility to go, well, if everyone understood it this way, and all of our brothers and sisters in Christ have the Holy Spirit, we have to at least presume there's some likelihood that the Holy Spirit was giving them the correct interpretation. Doesn't mean it's necessary, but it does give us reason to pause and to at least consider where they were coming from to see if that's in the scripture. Because again, our conscience is held captive only to the scripture. And it reminds me of what Pastor talked about and going deeper not that long ago and also uh, on Iron Sharpens Iron about uh, Thomas C. Odin. And on his gravestone, there is no new contribution to theology. Right? He wishes that that will be on his gravestone. And I'm thinking he's famous enough now he might get that wish. But if that's good for a gravestone, that should be for anyone teaching up here. Pastor or myself or Michael or John, whoever is teaching up there, shouldn't be telling you anything that no one's ever told anyone before. We shouldn't be treading over new grounds. Okay? So that's why if I go back and I look at these are what a lot of these great interpreters of the scripture have understood... I'm just trying not to tread any new ground on this topic, all right? And so that's why when we unwrap God's final response to Job, we see that God dwells upon his sovereignty over two beasts, behemoth and Leviathan. Now, who exactly are these beasts? Now, most interpreters through church history have viewed them as analogs for Satan, okay? We're going to talk about their little realities in a second, but their significance, according to these interpreters, is that Leviathan specifically is a representation of Satan. Who are some of these interpreters? We'll start with Gregory the Great, who's the first commentator on the book of Job. Thomas Aquinas, who's probably the greatest raw genius in church history. John Calvin, in his commentary in Isaiah, he speaks about this in chapter 27, verse 1. He's the greatest systematic theologian in church history. Joseph Carroll, he's the writer of the longest commentary on Job in church history. Matthew Henry and his comments in Job 3. Jonathan Edwards, Silas Durand, and A.W. Pink all have fingered that the significance of Leviathan is that he's an analog for Satan. Now, does that mean he is? No. But do we have reason to pause and reflect upon maybe there's something to this idea if all these men have mentioned this and have taught this. I think there's reason to pause and reflect upon that, and I'm convinced from the scripture, and we'll give reasons for that, that this is indeed the case. Now, many will point out that when I read about Leviathan, he really sounds like a real beast. He's given all these descriptions, something that Job would expect to see. Well, even if this is the case, I think what John Calvin writes in his commentary would apply towards this. John Calvin writes, 
The word Leviathan is variously interpreted, but in general, it simply denotes either a large serpent or whales and sea fishes, which approach the character of monsters on account of their huge size. For my part, I have no doubt that he speaks allegorically of Satan and his whole kingdom, describing him under the figure of some monstrous animal. That's John Calvin. So, for our intents and purposes, here we'll presume that these great beasts of some sort of, are of some sort of being described, but the significance of these beasts is their representation of the Prince of Darkness and our inability to resist him. All right, so that's what I th I'm gonna teach the significance of chapters 40 and 41 are about. They're about the Prince of Darkness, how imposing he is, and man's inability apart from the grace of God of resisting Satan. All right, so let's start with chapter 40. Now, Job has been put in his place by God. God just gave his responses in chapters 38 and 39. And Job responds, behold, I am insignificant. What more can I reply to you? I will add nothing more. That's Job 40, verses 5 to 6. And if you're not in Job chapter 40, I should have told you you should turn there because we'll be in 40 and 41 today. So if the book ended here, I believe Job's repentance would be sufficient. He understood not to, he was not fit to question God. He did not have the power, the intellect to control all of creation's minutia, like we learned about in chapters 38 and 39. However, God wants him to add something more to his response. Job says, I will add nothing more. God keeps talking. So he wants something more in Job's response. Let's see what that's all about. I think God wants him to know that he himself works all in all in the heavens and the earth. Job didn't say that yet. He said, I'm insignificant, I don't know. God's like, I want you to know a little more than that. Now, liberal commentators are not very big fans of Job's response. And J. Gerald Jansen's commentary, he writes, Job's response at first glance seems disappointingly submissive. Ooh, a retreat from the honesty of the dialogues. So being that he doesn't like that Job is being so submissive to God, because you know, we know how bad that is, um, he posits, well, the Hebrew word behold maybe could mean if. So we should really understand Job's response to be, if I am so insignificant like you say, why should I even bother talking to you? Oh, can't believe people pay money to learn that in seminary. It's very, very sad. Now, without an expertise in Hebrew, I think context alone disallows such a conclusion. First, God's response wouldn't make sense. He takes two chapters to detail these beasts that we just learned the most commentaries throughout history represent Satan. Why to take all that time if Job just gave you a sarcastic response? Now, I'm guessing if you took the literal view that, well, they're not, there's no spiritual significance to these beasts, they're just really big animals, I guess God's saying if being sovereign over those little animals does not make you feel insignificant, then I'm really going to wow you with the big ones. But I, I think we all sense there's something more to that in God's response. Second, Job repents again in chapter 42, displaying an explicit understanding of God's sovereignty over the forces of evil. So if, God's, if Job's response is, oh, well, you know, if I'm really so insignificant, why should we even have this discussion? You know, then you have this two other chapters detailing how God's sovereign, and then Job responds by understanding that sovereignty. So the liberal interpretation just doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. And now that we've covered this whole book, we start seeing how it all connects, how it all flows. Even where it doesn't seem that it does, it does. So for just to be kind of this meaningless, sarcastic comment out of nowhere seems just more to appeal to some people's overly imaginative imaginations and not uh, what we could get from the text. Now, before God gets into Behemoth and Leviathan, God gives a strongly worded repudi uh, repudiation of Job's questioning of his justice in verses 7 to 14. We're going to spend some time here, so let's get our eyes on verses 7 to 14. It appears that God uses the opportunity of Job's repentance to correct him in the strongest possible terms. All right? And Job's increased humility has put him in the position to accept what God has to say. So in verse 7, God says, Now gird up your loins like a man, I will ask you, and you instruct me. So we read the same thing in Job 38.3. Here God's beginning to correct Job for questioning his righteousness by applying that Job is too insignificant to instruct him. 
We've already tread over this ground, but I think it shows that God is not in man's debt. He does not learn from us. We learn from God, all right? And we are not in the position to teach God what is just. Point taken, let's move on. Job 48. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Now, I think this question is God's comeback to Job's questioning of his justice throughout the book. I think we've heard uh, some people say, well, I don't think Job was really condemning God. Well, how do you make sense of this verse? Will you condemn me? Was God misspeaking? I don't think so. I think God's response is saying, just because you're dissatisfied, does that make me less right? The answer is no. Will you condemn me in order to justify yourself? The answer is no. All right? And I'd say looking at human history, man does not have the track record to question God. Whenever we've done what we wanted, we screwed things up. We've already did our list of examples of that, the Holocaust, Khmer Rouge, all sorts of things. So who are we to question God? We were like, God, you didn't protect us from ourselves, is usually what we're really complaining about. Verse 9. Or do you have an arm like God and can thunder with a voice like his? Now, Job cannot snap his fingers and make things happen like God. Like we know in uh, Genesis 1, God has power in a spoken word. Do you have a voice like mine, God says? No, Job doesn't. He does, his voice, his spoken word does not have power. God redeems with an outstretched arm. We read in Exodus 6.6. 6. Could Job save anyone? He couldn't save himself. His arm doesn't have the strength that God does. So that puts us, we, we're not in the spot then to question God's justice because we can't meet justice. God can. Verse 10, adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. What's God saying here? Now with his honor and majesty, I think us as men, we have common sense. We could read the Bible, we could build things. We're made in God's image, so we're dignified in that sense, but not in the glorious way God is, because by Job's own admission, in Job 29, 14, he said, I put on righteousness, which I interpret to mean God's righteousness, and it clothed me, and my justice was like a robe and a turban. So God says, could you clothe yourself with honor and glory and, the, and these sort of things? And the answer is not of your own, you can only do it with mine. Right? But God is clothed in his own glory because he's glorious. That's part of his nature. All right? So therefore, if man is not righteous apart from the grace of God, how can a depraved being know how the world ought to be if he cannot make himself what he ought to be? So I think man is impotent. I think he's a lot like a 12-year-old backseat driver. He likes to tell you the person driving what they ought to do, but he really has no idea. And that's us when we question God's justice. All right? And I think God is saying, if you could show, you know, if you could show that this is not the case, Job, then I will confess to you that your own right hand could save you in verse 14. Obviously, Job can't say that, so God will not make that confession. Verses 11 to 13. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together. Bind them in the hidden place. I think the point here is pretty simple. God can and he does exact justice. Here he's exacting justice against the proud and he's humbling them. And Job says, why did the wicked prosper in his responses earlier in the book? Well, man doesn't stop the wicked from prospering. Job was a judge. That was his job. And he couldn't do that perfectly. And God's saying, who are you to question me? You just, by your own admission, couldn't stop it. I do. God humbles the proud, and he raises up those who are humble. Man can't do that. So now let's move on to Behemoth and Leviathan. Let's now first introduce what these beasts are about. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe, maybe I missed it. Sure. You connect 6 through 14 with what Job says in 4 and 5. How does what follows? You mean 7 through 14? Mm -hmm. In verses 4 and 5. Yes. Why does God answer him the way he does? Um, here's my answer. might not be a good answer. I think God's essentially ignoring Job's answer. 
He's returning back to what Job said during his spoken speeches, <coughs> and he's using that to be an introduction to his next couple chapters, which is about Behemoth and Leviathan, in which he's awaiting for Job's proper response. So it's not that God takes issue with the response Job gives, but Job only gave half of the response God wanted. So I, I think that God's trying to recenter the, um, the conversation, so to say. Sort of like, I'm going here in a million directions. You might raise your hand and say, Craig, let's return to this. And I, I think that's what God's doing. So it's not God taking issue with Job's response. Job's response, as I said, was completely appropriate. It's just that it helps us to know it's more than us being insignificant. We should have an understanding of God's sovereignty as well. And I think that's what God's trying to recenter the conversation upon. Does that make sense? Okay. So now on to Behemoth and Leviathan. Now, most interpreters have conflated these two beings to really be just the same as one another. They're both just Satan. So I'm going to give you some kind of roundabout explanations of what Leviathan is, and it's going to help us understand both these beasts. First, from Silas Durant, again, 19th century Reformed Baptist preacher. If this wonderful description were applied merely to the whale, which he means Leviathan, some parts of it would hardly seem appropriate. Though the fearful admiration with which he inspires the mind is fully expressed through this highly figurative language. But there's more than a literal fish or serpent, be he ever, never so great presented here. This is that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, whose abode is in the deep, the great source of all the various manifestations of evil, the prince of darkness. Here is innate wickedness considered in its own essential being as a separate thing, unaffected by human interests or affections, which seems to soften or par partially cover its hideous fearfulness as it's manifested in the world. And here's a synopsis from Thomas Aquinas. To preclude one from believing that man by his own power can overcome the devil, God uses the image of Leviathan, because he has such great power that he cannot be held by a fish hook. And to show this, he says, and will you bind his tongue with a cord? For fish which are caught with a hook are bound by the line which is attached to the hook. This means that no man could take the devil away from his malice or even bind, bind him to keep him from doing this evil. So if we're going to say what these beasts are literally, behemoth might be an elephant. Leviathan seems to me really to be a dragon. These different beasts are supposed to offer us a picture of our inability to combat Satan, like we just heard uh, Aquinas speak about. So behemoth is the elephant that man can't hunt, but God can. And Leviathan uh, is this dragon that cannot be caught by a fisherman, for no, for no man could bind him from doing evil. But however, God could bind the strong man, like we read in Matthew 12, 29. Um, and I would add, like, well, you don't think of dragons in the water. I just think of those old-timey maps, and they show you the ocean, and the dragons, like, doing this. So maybe that's what they're thinking about with the fish hook. So therefore, man cannot defend himself against Satan, and this means apart from God's grace and his protective hedge, we're goners. So the logic goes, God is righteous because he can actually thwart evil while man cannot. Right? Now, concerning behemoth, what's the word mean? In Hebrew, it literally means beasts, plural, with an S on the end. The word, behem the word behema, which just means beast or like an ox, is used 172 times in the scripture. So the word behemoth, which is the plural, is only used once in the book of Job. The singular term is used quite a few times. So behemoth in this chapter is a singular being so it's strange that he would have a plural in his name you know it'd be like uh i don't know what's that animal it's a birds <laughs> i know it just doesn't sound right but that's that's what it is so the question is is there significance to this or is this a divinely inspired typo i don't think it's a divinely inspired typo the plural usage is odd but it's not the first time in the Bible that, uh, that demons are spoken about in the plural and the singular. All right? Satan is not omnipresent, so he can't be everywhere. That's why there's demons. There's many angels. I'd probably more, I would presume more angels on the good side and the bad side than there's ever been people. But there's lots of them, and they could be in all sorts of places like we are. And we could see that sometimes several demons could possess a singular individual. We know from Mark 5, 9, where, uh, I'm going to pronounce the, the word wrong, Gerasene demoniac. Does that sound kind of right? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. That 
They go, he says, my, my name, singular, is legion, for we are many. So we have some indication in the Bible that we could take something singular, has a demonic character, and it's in reality a plural. So that's what I think the significance of behemoth is, that it's the plurality of demons being personified in the singular being, while Leviathan is a singular being. He's the Satan, the devil. If you read Job in the original Hebrew, when it speaks of Satan's in, Satan in chapter 1 and 2, it doesn't call him Satan, actually. The Hebrew has a definite article in front of the word Satan, which just means accuser in Hebrew. So it says, the accuser, the accuser, the Satan, the Satan. All right? So Leviathan is the Satan, the one, and behemoth's just the demonic realm. I have to admit, that's me going out on a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of a stretch. Most interpreters just say it's Satan. I think that might be the significance of being plural. Well, anyway, it doesn't affect too much how we interpret this. What does the existence of Behemoth teach us? First, Behemoth does not exist by accident because he's first among the creative acts of God. We see this in verses 15 and 19. Why do demons exist? God made them. Why do angels exist? God made them. Why does anything exist? God made it. Why does anything happen? God ordains it. All right, so this is not a divine accident. And we could see this in Genesis 3.1 where it speaks to the serpent. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So behemoth is first among the ways of God. He is made by God. God is responsible for behemoth. Second, behemoth eats grass like an ox. Verse 15. What's the significance of this? The wicked are often conflated with grass throughout the scripture. We see this in Psalm 95, Psalm 92, 7, Isaiah 46 to 7, Luke 12, 28, and James 1, 10. Just as the sinful people wither and fade into death like the grass, according to the psalmist in 37, 2, demons feed upon sinful men, and by that, they're led to eternal death, damnation. All right? So like an ox that can eat almost limited amount of, amounts of grass for hours, the demonic realm is feeding upon men limitlessly. They're never satisfied for their appetite. So that's my interpretation of behemoth eats grass like an ox. Third, behemoth is powerful and seemingly impervious to attack. So man cannot stop him. Just like apart from the hedge, Job can't stop Satan from attacking him. So left to ourselves, we cannot stop being tempted by demons because we are depraved. All right? So verse uh, 4, God is the master of behemoth because only his maker brings near behemoth's sword or his sword. I think Aquinas has a, a very easy to understand interpretation of this verse. He writes, to preclude one from thinking that he that is man is the first of the ways of God, God says, he that is God who made him, that's behemoth, will direct his sword, that is, his injurious act. The will to do harm comes from the devil in himself because of this he's called his sword. But the effect of harming can only come from the divine will or divine permission. All right, so the Lord minces no meat about it. The injurious act, meaning the sword of behemoth, is directed by God. God uses Satan. He uses evil. He uses good. He uses everything for his purposes, for his righteous and good purposes. Man doesn't like thinking those things of this way. We think things are very narrow. But God says in Isaiah 45, 7, he makes light in the darkness, the fortune and woe. He ordains all things. So God's in control of everything. And he doesn't back down from this in Job's response. He doesn't say, oh, you know, I know you're suffering a lot, so let me try to put some, you know, make some icing on this cake, make it a little more palatable. He just tells Job exactly how it is. Fifth, the, Lord, the world is in the hands of this beast. I interpret this from verse 20 in chapter 40. Surely the mountains bring him food, and all the beasts of the field play there. Now, kind of don't like to use the word beast in the translation because behemoth means the word beast in the plural. So we're wondering, is this the same word? And the answer is no. It's just the word hayat in Hebrew, which of course I'm pronouncing wrong because I pronounce English words wrong. But it's just the word for animals. So the animals of the field play there. And the word play in the Hebrew there is essentially means to laugh with usually scorn. You know, like when the, the Hebrews um, built the golden calf and they went out to play. So this is not exactly a word with positive connotations. It almost sounds like 
The mountains bring food, the world's in this demon's hands, and the men play about and they're enjoying their sin and they think nothing of it. So this is not a positive picture of demons or men, in my opinion. Again, this is taking the allegorical view. Otherwise, it's mountains are literally bringing this animal food and people are playing near it, however you want to interpret it. Six, the men or the beast during all this do not notice that Behemoth is hiding in the Jordan River. We can see this in uh, verses 21 to 23. And I think the significance of this is the Jordan is traditionally this border for Israel. So Israel is the promised land, God's people. And like we know in Revelation, there's the New Jerusalem. What's outside of the New Jerusalem? Does anyone remember? Well, yeah, Gehenna. Outside of Jerusalem is hell, even in Revelation. And so in this border, Behemoth is waiting. So it's almost like we're safe in Israel, but just crouching at the door is Satan. And I think that's all of us as Christians that we, when we walk faithfully, we pray to God that he'll protect us. But oftentimes when we pursue sin, we cross that border, the demons are there to tempt us. And so this might be just a visual picture of that, keyword might. All right, now on to Leviathan. Now, first, we're chapter 41, verses 1 to 2. When God asks Job whether he can draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or put a rope in his nose, we can infer that God can draw out Satan and put him to work, like an ox with a rope in its nose. So how does God put Satan in the work? Matthew Poole, in his commentary, writes, He governs the deceiver and sets bounds to his deceits, to whom and when and how far they shall extend. So, like we speculated before, God manipulates Satan by putting hedges. He manipulates us, so to say, by putting hedges. We want to do evil, but he protects us with a hedge from doing what we'd otherwise want to do. Satan wants to do evil to us, but like we saw Job, he can prevent it with hedges. So that's what I think Matthew Poole's talking about, that God uh, sets bounds to whom and when and what Satan could do. Second, doesn't the following in chapter 41 sound like someone we know? Let me read it. Verses 3 to 4. Will he, that's Leviathan, make many supplications to you? Or will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him for a servant forever? I kind of hear hints here of a conversation I heard earlier in this book. Satan, what are you up to? Oh, you know, just kind of walking around the world and stuff. I'm not up to anything all that bad. Well, consider my servant Job. Well, he's not really that good, I think. If you let me touch him, you put that hedge away, I could do something about that. It sounds like Job is playing with, uh, God is playing with Satan, like it says in verse 5, like Leviathan is, is played with like a bird. And Satan is, un, is made a servant of God, not on purpose, but because he's manipulated and controlled with these hedges. And God knows his nature, he knows our natures. And that's how God could ordain all things, though we will things sometimes that aren't even good, that are in fact wicked and against God's will. So... Again, this description here does not make a lot of sense if we're talking about an animal, especially because animals don't speak, but it makes a lot more sense if it talks about Satan, especially in light of what we read in chapters 1 and 2. Third, just like Behemoth, man can't beat him, that is Leviathan, in battle, but God can. Verses 7 to 8. Can he fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him, remember the battle. You will not do it again. Fourth, Job is wrong when he said that if God turned his gaze away, he would be better off. Because if we remember in Job's response, Job's like, if you, you know, when will you turn your gaze away from me? As if God watching over his life was something bad. It just meant he would have trouble after trouble. Every time he sinned, God would be looking to come after him. I think God's response to that is in verses 9 to 10 here. Behold, your expectation is false. Will you be laid low even at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he dares to arouse him. Who then is he that can stand before me? So Job thought during his speeches that if it were not for God, left himself, he would have avoided all suffering. But we actually saw what happened in heaven. God's response is that any expectation Job has is going out on his own uh, and confronting evil on his own is foolish. Because what happens when Job is on his own and God removes the hedge? His whole life falls apart. And that's true of every one of us. God holds us back from doing the evil we'd otherwise do and protects us from evils that would otherwise befall us. So that's what I think God's saying here, that Job's expectation is false because he'd be laid low at the sight of Leviathan, i.e. Satan. 
if we saw what Satan could do, we would never say, oh, we don't need God, I could do this on my own. All right, so, got to turn the page, a little late to Comatica. All right, so, fifth, God is in the right to ordain evil and to work it for his purposes. Job 41.11, which is probably my favorite verse in the book, God says, Who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So it seems like God's responding to like a question Job or maybe some of us have mumbled under our breath. Why would he make such an evil, terrible thing like Leviathan? I don't like him. <laughs> and God's response is, we've given nothing to him in which he owes us, and he'd be liable to listen to our demands that we place upon him. All right? We might not like that answer, but if we really meant not our will but your will be done, it intuitively makes the most sense. So if God wills that Leviathan and all the attendant evils along with him exist, then God knows best, because everything under heaven belongs to him. And we have given nothing to him in which to demand otherwise. God, in his wisdom, reserves the right to use something evil like Leviathan, and to use him against his will to work good and to work righteousness. And that's what God is doing. God is not the author of evil. Now, concerning God using evil to work for good, I think Augustine synthesizes this information we just learned very well. All right? Augustine writes, For what could be said more plainly than what is actually said as concerning the gospel, they, here the Jews, are enemies for your sakes. He's quoting Romans eleven twenty eight. It is therefore in the power of the wicked to sin, but that in sinning they should do this or that. Wickedness is not in their power, but in God's, who divides the darkness and regulates it, so that hence even what they do contrary to God's will is not fulfilled except to it be God's will. All right? So it is as if God is telling Job, yes, I expose you to suffering, but can't you see that Satan is the source of it? I am master over Satan. I permit him to do his work. He will not be allowed to truly harm you, can't you see? Though you lose everything, you do not lose your faith. In the loss of your physical blessings, you may be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing all things. So he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Trust and follow me. So we have to roll with the punches, kind of like what Pastor's sermon was on New Year's Eve. I really liked it. we got to be students of suffering. I'm going to steal from Pastor. We have to know that God is teaching us through suffering. He's doing it for our good, and he's sovereign over it. It's in the power of the wicked to sin. God exposes us. That's suffering. That's the result of sin, but he does it for our good because we are his students. We are his disciples. Sixth, Job 41, 12 to 34 described Leviathan in a way that is, important, that is impotent. When this first dawned on me, I thought it was really cool. Now, some of you might say, how could he say that? How could he say that he's impotent? He sounds so scary. He has strong limbs. We read about in verse 12. Around his teeth, there's terror in verse 13. Um, his strong scales are his pride. His armor's so tight, air can't pass through it. All he can say is yawn. You know, he must have some really bad gingivitis. The most terrible part of his body is around his teeth. It's not even the teeth. It's his gums. All right. Verse 18 says, his sneezes flash forth light. So I guess having the flu could be really scary, but we're not talking about something here that sounds like this dragon really has power. The sword that reaches him cannot avail. His underparts are like sharp, sharp pot shards. That sounds like one scary beast hiding his armor. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if you notice, none of these things are aggressive qualities. You don't hear about Leviathan's fist. You don't hear about his claws. You don't hear about his weapons. You just see a cowering, sneezing dragon hiding behind his armor. Because that's what Satan is in light of God. Satan is not a powerful being. You know, like I joked around a, a few weeks ago, I said I saw something on YouTube, listening to a sermon, and sometimes when they have sermons and nothing else going on, you just have a picture in the background. The picture was Satan and Jesus arm wrestling, and you know, that veins like popping out on their foreheads like it's a real struggle. But Satan's a creative being. He would stand no chance. You know, he's a cowering dragon hiding behind his armor that only weaklings like us would have reason to fear. But to God, he's nothing. All right. Seventh, Leviathan is obviously not a beast that lived on earth abiding by the laws of physics. I think this is really important because I've heard, well, Leviathan really sounds like a real beast that, you know, 
Someone might have saw one day, uh, and I think this is more the Ken Ham crowd that are looking for dinosaurs in the Bible. So every time they see a giant in Canaan or they see Leviathan, well, it's got to be a dinosaur because we've got to explain the Museum of Natural Science somehow in light of the Bible. And, uh, and I think I have to really question what Discovery Channel they're watching because in verses 18 to 21, this does not sound like a real being. Not only does he talk, as we know earlier, his sneezes flash forth light. His eyes are like eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils smoke goes forth, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes forth from his mouth. Now, obviously, this is a dragon. Now, I don't know. I purposely don't like dragon movies, so I never watched any of them. I, I think there's a cartoon called My Pet Dragon or something, so I know they're out there. But uh, I think that's a dragon. Tell me if I'm wrong. That sounds like what I've heard dragons do. And I know that in God all things are possible, so I can't say it's impossible there really was a fire-breathing dragon. God could do anything, all right? And maybe those fossils and bones really are fire-breathing dragons. I don't know. I wasn't there. Okay. Um, but do we really honestly think we had a dragon walking around with shot part shards on its stomach, and this is really what God's describing, and he talked? And maybe in a Disney movie, but I, I just don't think that's what the scripture is teaching here. It makes much more sense to interpret this beast, here the dragon, as an analog for Satan, who Revelation calls dragon. Imagine that. Here's what I think the passage is saying. Satan rules over the earth for a time and terrorizes man with his intimidating qualities. And during this time, Satan is proud as lord over the demons and wicked men. Verse 25, the book says, when he, that's Levian, raises himself up the gods' fear. Well, who are the gods? The gods are probably just lowercase g, likely demons. However, we do know, I forget the psalm, Psalm 82, gods could also be a term, a sarcastic term for unjust men. But Satan is lord over them. Job 41, 34. He is king over the sons of pride. So again, same idea. Leviathan sows chaos in the sea by making the depths bo a boiling pot in verse 31. And behind him, he makes the wake to shine in 32, which I think is Satan leaves a trail of destruction in his path. You can see where he was. You can see where the tsunami hit. You know, you could see where when the towers went down and all the things that the devil has tempted men in their wickedness to do. All right. It says, though nothing on earth is like Leviathan, God has made him without fear in verse 33, but he's destined to fail in his mission. So Leviathan and his attendant evils are part, part of God's plans. Man's own self-deception in worshiping Leviathan, the satanic beast, is explicitly consistent with God's purposes. We've covered this before, Revelation 17, 17. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. As Augustine observes, God sustains even the demons and all men who commit wickedness to, fif uh, to fulfill his righteous purposes. See, if I can't pronounce fulfill, what? how could I pronounce Hebrew? Sorry. <laughs> this is what Augustine writes in the Handbook of Hope, Faith, and Love, chapter 27. But the goodness of the Creator never fails to supply life and vital power to the wicked angels, without which their existence would soon come to an end. Or in the case of mankind, who sprang from a condemned and corrupt stock to impart form and life to their seed, to fashion their members, and through the very seasons of their life and in the different parts of the earth, to quicken their senses and bestow upon them the nourishment they need. For he judged it better to bring good out of evil than not to permit any evil to exist. Which I've quoted a few times, but now you know the context of that quote. Further, Augustine says, Nor can we doubt that God does well even in the permission of what is evil. For he permits it only in the justice of his judgment, and surely all that is just is good. Although therefore evil, insofar as it is evil, is not a good, yet the fact that evil as well as good exists is a good. It sounds like R.C. Sproul stole that. If we remember, R.C. Sproul said evil in of itself is evil, but it's good to have evil. It sounds, it's exactly the same point that Augustine said right there. But again, there will be no new theology if it's good theology. Augustine continues, For if it were not a good that evil should exist, its existence would not be permitted by the omnipotent good, who without doubt 
can as easily refuse to permit what he does not wish as bring about what he does wish. So in translation, if evil wasn't going to serve good purposes, then God wouldn't let any evil happen because he's, he's, he's all powerful. That's just the facts. So God fulfills his purposes by exploiting wickedness and, pow and the power of Leviathan and man alike. God is righteous, and in doing so, he brings about the greatest possible goods so that he may work all things for good. We may conclude from the preceding descriptions that Behemoth and Leviathan are imposing beasts, at least to us. We're shattered when confronted with them. However, to God, they are mere playthings. He could pull out Leviathan with a fish hook as if he were nothing. So God's answer to Job is now clear. He is sovereign over nature to suit his purposes. We see that in chapter 38. We, we can see that in, in that chapter in the description of weather and the seasons. God is sovereign over the temperaments of all different sort of men. And we see that in chapter 39 in God's description of the animal kingdom. And lastly, God is sovereign over the demonic realm, which includes Satan himself. And we can see that in this description of Behemoth and Leviathan. So there's absolutely nothing that's not under God's control. And that's why Job's confession in chapter 42 now makes sense. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job 42, 2. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So we have any questions, because that's what I prepared for today. <laughs> yes, David. So, um, going back to 41, I'm a man Mm -hmm. So, like, I acknowledge up front that my reason Mine could be too. <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I want to also have to I, I, I agree that the, what is important about the Amazon mm -hmm. that represents the power of Satan, Satan itself, and God's utter mastery over mm -hmm. it. However, as you said the other day, yes. the power of an analogy is that there's this real thing mm -hmm. that Yeah. You know what a burning fire is. Mm -hmm. You experience that. Yeah. And God's wrath is much worse. Mm -hmm. Or we say God is like a father, right? We, oh, how, how much greater he is. is. Yeah. He's a real father who is loving and affectionate mm -hmm. and providing and protecting. And God is so much more. Yeah. Right? Amen. And then look at these descriptions here in mm -hmm. 41. Um, it appears to me that God is describing something which is familiar to Job, something which he has seen interacted with. Now, I, I'm not saying this is a very important point. It does yeah. not affect our theology. It yes. Affect our a little bit. But, yeah. But our, our Ken Ham Museum might be affected. Yes. 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 Now, and I think that's completely consistent, especially with what Calvin said, for example. He said, yes, it could be this great, terrible fish, like a whale or a shark, but it's from that comparison we could draw this truth that it's this allegory. Um, I personally just think that we can only take that position by actually taking away from what is said, that the beast talks, that it breathes fire. Um, and I'd say you, the point you made that an analogy has realities. And I think, well, not always. Analogy could have something that we understand that doesn't have to be real. You know, for example, if I made an analogy about a pixie, pixies don't exist. If I made an analogy about a unicorn, unless you're talking about the actual original unicorn, the rhinoceros. If you're talking about, you know, the unicorn, the horse, the thing in its nose, you know, that doesn't really exist. Yet I can make an analogy and we can all understand what we're talking about. So, like I said, it's it's not impossible of God to really make this being for this being to have really walked the earth. I mean, the scripture says there were giants. We, we know for a fact there were very tall men that don't exist. Um, so it's not impossible. However, I just, I think the language, and this is what Silas Duran says, 
it's so grandiose. It, it almost demands that we know that this is something that we're acquainted with on the level almost of myth instead of reality. You know, for example, when the Bible literally says God stabbed Leviathan with a spear, do we really think David, the Satan really looked like this dragon in the ocean and he was literally stabbed with a spear? I mean, I suppose it could work that way, but I would say God could use analogies of pictures that we understand very well without that picture actually having a literal reality, just like God can make an analogy or a parable with stuff that is real that we do understand and do it the same way. So that would be my, res my response to that. Either way works. Yes, Tammy. No, just adding to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the creatures. You know, and so in a sense, like creature, 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 mm -hmm. you know, to maybe worship the creatures. And while I, I can kind of see what you're saying, I do think, like, in verse 18 of chapter 39, when he speaks of the ostriches, which he knows not the ostriches, or not the ostriches, I don't think he's got He speaks of the ostrich, wherever it was, um, as if it laughs. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing they make funny noises. <laughs> something definitely to consider. Um, I'd say while the ostrich laugh could be compared to probably a real noise they make, you know, that it's, you know, if Leviathan is really, let's say, a whale or something, do they, is that, is, what's breathing fire then? What do you compare it to? It, it, it gets a little more tenuous. It's possible, but also, like I said, I think the more mythic idea also works. Both work. Yes, Pastor. Mm -hmm. So there is more to it than, you know, an ostrich making a funny sound. <laughs> there is intent, for lack of a better word, in the lap as well. And the, and the question is, do we have a Discovery Channel video of when an ostrich outruns something, do they make a noise? <laughs> yeah, I, I see what you mean, no, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> But that's only when he stops, though. That's when he stops. I don't think he does it when he's running. Um, Joseph, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I did. And a lot of people already mentioned what I wanted to speak about. But, uh, you know, my, my, the problem I'm having is that uh, it seems that you're all in unison about seeing, you know, Leviathan and, and, and um, what's the other one? Leviathan. Behemoth. Behemoth as, as Satan. It just seems to me to have a lot of problems if we go that route. I, I just can't make that connection, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think Tammy has alluded to this, especially when coming off of Job 39. We've got creatures mm -hmm. who are spoken of and are to be understood naturally, whether it's the, the ostrich, the horse, uh, you know, the hawk. But then we get to verse 40, and then we go into more of an allegorical view. Why, why is that? Um, as opposed to understanding that maybe some great huge beast, which would verify you know, that God is supreme because he has control even over the biggest thing that Job may have ever seen mm -hmm. in his life. Uh, if that happens to be a dinosaur, whether a T-Rex or something big, so we, we've got uh -huh. bones, mm -hmm. so there's evidence something huge did exist before. Um, and so I, I just don't know why, how we make that sort of interpretive uh, um, uh, a decision 
to say it's an allegory and depicts Satan himself? I'd say, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Biblically, we know what Leviathan is because he's mentioned in other parts of the Bible. And we already know it has to do with creation and that he's destroyed. And that in Isaiah 26, 21 and Isaiah 27, 1, it's explicitly Satan and he's judged in the end. So then the question is, is this just a beast and we're not supposed to import any of that meaning that we know from other parts of the Bible? Um, that, just from a interpretive viewpoint, I find persuasive for the allegorical interpretation. And that's why in this lesson I started with, you know, these are the, the thinkers that took this viewpoint for the same reason. And you could, like I said, Calvin, Aquinas, A.W. Pink, you know, Gregory the Great, you know, uh, Joseph Carroll, who made the longest commentary on this book. And so they could be wrong. Like I said, you know, there could be no allegory with the animals, no allegory with these great beasts. And we're just supposed to interpret them as, yeah, God is bigger than the really big beast, so he's bigger than everything. And that, not that that's not true. It's not like you get anything false from understanding it that way. It's just that I think when so many in the church have understood this to be something more, and that we know in the scripture that the name Leviathan ha has to do with Satan, and when we read about Leviathan, he's fire-breathing, he's a dragon, and we know that dragon is a thing for Satan in Revelation. It, it asks a lot to me to think, well, we're not supposed to import any of that meaning onto it. So that, that's where I'm coming from anyway. Yes, Mike. Yes. Yeah, I, I've heard that. With the postures and stuff like that, like the broken, you know, how their, how their bodies are. I mean, a lot of that description. And if you say beast, every time you say beast, we're referring to Satan. There's plenty of times where beasts are referring to beasts that we know about. So that one, I mean, the Bible. Well, but that's, that's, just to interrupt, that's why I said, uh, the term behemoth is not a term where we can import meaning to it. Behemoth is a regular word. It just means it just means beasts, plural. It just means animals. So you're not giving the same meaning no. to that as you are with Leviathan. No. Leviathan, you're saying, is the devil. Levi specifically, I speculate that behemoth is something demonic. And I think because it's plural, it's a plural of demons. So I'm just taking that straight from the fact that it's a plural. Um, when it comes to... Behemoth and Leviathan speaking of both something demonic. That's just something that most interpreters have said Well, it's really the same description for both being that first of the way of God and and stuff to that effect um, On one other comment because I wasn't gonna bring it up today simply because I figured eh, it's a little too narrow About the Egyptian loan word stuff like I I'm interested in that sort of things when I learned about the etymology of words uh, but when they study these things a lot of it's speculation they find a sort of similar word in you know ancient Egyptian and then it looks sort of similar when you sound it out to it in Hebrew and they go well maybe it's the same word and it could be but it could also not be so it's you know we have to have a degree of humility when we approach these things and uh, and uh, we don't do this often but pray for your Bible translators there's just so much in the art of translation how they find out what's a word mean and you know part of it it's like the Rosetta Stone there was Greek and uh, Coptic and I think hieroglyphics on it and that's how they know what Coptic is and they know what Greek is and then you start figuring out what the hieroglyphics mean and You know when we go into all these dead languages, that's how we find out a lot of words We look for the same book translated in a different different ancient language and then you could kind of narrow down What's the word mean? What's maybe the meaning of the word come from? and uh, It's it's an interesting topic, but not when we're I jump to any conclusion strictly based upon what we think the word means. And that's why I would say with behemoth, it's something more that we just know it's a plural and we don't want to import too many meaning. The Bible gives us a meaning for Leviathan. Isaiah does in 26 and 27. And in, uh, and in Psalm 74. 
So we, the Bible defines that for us, so we have a greater level of certainty than we would have just based upon the etymology of a word like behemoth, which is otherwise a common word. You still have a comment? Yeah, just on that, that translation idea. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the Jews, ancient Hebrew, and then they're really with the, they're living in Egypt for 400 years. Yep. Hebrew is such, it's such an interesting language. It's like uh, proto-Hebrew, like the Hebrew you see today, like if you drive past the Hasidic Jews, that is not the Hebrew the original Bible is written in. Hebrew looks like Phoenician, which is technically a Greek language, and actually Greek comes from Phoenician. So Hebrew really looks like Phoenician, and the words sound a lot more like uh, Akkadian, and it's closer to Aramaic than even Egyptian, which is interesting because Egypt was closer and politically dominated the region more. And like the word God in the Bible, El, is also the chief deity of, uh, of the Canaanites. Uh, the Ugaritic texts say El is the chief God, chief God and bows below him. And they used the word because everyone knew that El meant a really important God. And that's the name God in the Bible, like Bethel, house of God. And so their language is very interesting. And, but we got to be careful sometimes conclusions we draw because there are certain liberal scholars will say, well, that proves, it doesn't. They'll say, that proves that the Jewish religion evolved from polytheistic Canaanite religions because it shares words. And that's not true because the Greeks are polytheists, but what's the Greek word for God? I think we know this. Theos, you like theology, right? Just because the Greeks are polytheists doesn't mean people that use the word theology are polytheists. So it's not good logic, but it's a very interesting topic, getting into the languages. Um, one last comment, Tammy, then I think we gotta, we gotta call it quits. Yes? Yep. Mm -hmm. And he, and he is, and I think, and the speech that we covered with God, that he works in all and through all, that's the only fitting answer to, to something like that. Um, Joseph, could you close this in prayer, please? Yeah.